27 September 1956. A four-engine bomber cruising at 30,000 feet in the California sky. Suspended from its bomb bay, an experimental airplane and its pilot. We are looking at preparations for the last flight of this airplane. We are looking at the last few moments of this man's lifetime. This plane is a new breed, the only one of its kind, handmade, 10 years in the building. This is the Bell X-2 rocket plane. At 9.30, the bomber will release it. A few seconds later, its rockets will ignite. And a young captain of the United States Air Force will fly faster than any human being has ever flown. For a little more than two minutes, he will live as no man has ever lived. Okay, we can drop you anytime. Give me the word for the countdown. Okay, counting from five to one. Five, four, three, two. Death for the pilot of the X-2 starts here, at a complex of landing strips fashioned from the desert. Flight Test Center at Edwards Air Force Base, California. Here the planes of today are tested and made ready for operation with the fighting services. And the planes of tomorrow wait tensely for their moment in the sky. They are experiments, none of them designed to carry a weapon of war, but only to probe the unknown, to penetrate the mysteries of space. Their mission is research, their goal, the unexplored. The first tool of air research is the wind tunnel, a man-made sample of the air above. At his laboratories in California, Ohio, and Virginia, scientists of the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics duplicate some of the conditions of flying. By forcing air at controlled speed past the stationary object in the tunnel, the same relative effect is achieved as of flying the object through the air. The stream of air, invisible to the naked eye, is measured and gauged by special instruments and recording devices. A remarkable process called Schlieren photography records high-speed winds in visual terms the human eye can perceive and understand. If the shock waves striking a supersonic projectile could be seen, this is what they would look like. This is how the air strikes a plane flying faster than sound. Schlieren photographs of various wing shapes confirm basic principles about the fluid quality of air and of its effect on aircraft passing through it. Measuring these previously invisible qualities by the Schlieren process provides clues to efficient design of aerodynamic shapes. Aerodynamic heating is today's most serious obstacle to high-speed flight. At supersonic speeds, temperatures of 300 degrees and more are generated around the airplane. The higher the speed, the higher the temperature. And NACA engineers study the effect of extreme heat on various shapes and materials to learn which will best penetrate and survive the thermal thicket. From such investigation, a new dilemma in design has emerged. Aerodynamic conditions favor a sharp nose for speed. But the faster the airplane, the more heat is generated, and a blunt nose is more resistant to high temperatures than a sharp one. The long investigative process to learn the nature of air and its effect on planes is one of theory, discovery, and proof. A frequent method of corroboration is the use of powerless missiles filled with instruments to measure aerodynamic effects and dropped from aircraft at high altitudes.
telemetering devices on the ground trace the course of the missile so that instruments can be recovered and studied for the information they have registered. To gather data in higher speed ranges, power is added, a rocket engine capable of speeds near the speed of sound. Instruments recovered from such missiles were in fact able to predict the possibility of piloted supersonic flight. The possibility of hypersonic flight is tested. Flight at 5, 10, 20 times the speed of sound. Scale models of current operational aircraft are loaded with instruments that record structural stresses, speed, altitude, deceleration, and the effect of the thermal thicket. Powerful rockets launch these models at speeds many times those possible in manned aircraft. The models are not recoverable, but the instruments automatically relay their information back to ground stations for automatic computation. Many gaps in our knowledge of the air are filled in with such basic tools of research. But eventually, each advance in theory must be proved by practical test. Here, full-size wings, designed according to principles observed and developed in laboratories, are tested for stress and strain on rocket sleds at supersonic speeds. The ultimate in aerodynamic exploration at speeds near or beyond the speed of sound is the research airplane. Closely guarded secrets, these airplanes have been specially built to exceed known aircraft performance, to test new ideas in design, to gather information about the air. They are flying laboratories, research tools only, but each requires a pilot. Each, in the performance of its mission, demands the risk of a human life. The Bell X-1, powered by a four-barrel rocket engine, its body design based on the symmetry of a 50 caliber bullet. The X-1 was the first airplane to fly through the sound barrier in level flight. The Douglas Skyrocket, rocket powered, first to reach a speed of Mach 2, twice the speed of sound. Bell X-1A, which flew to a record 1,650 miles per hour and to an altitude of 90,000 feet. The Douglas X-3, powered by two turbojet engines designed to investigate sustained jet-powered flight in the supersonic speed ranges. The very thin, straight wing of the needle-nose X-3 was a revolution in design that was soon to be adopted by the Air Force in a combat plane. The Lockheed F-104 Starfighter, which itself has become a research plane to study heat problems in sustained supersonic flight. Northrop's flying wing, the X-4, which investigated the stability of a tailless airplane. The Bell X-5, constructed with movable wings to explore the problems of wing sweep angles, and through its performance paved the way for development of today's swept-winged aircraft. Most ambitious of the X-planes is the Bell X-2, sleek, handmade of stainless steel. The only one of its kind, the X-2 has been constructed to test the problems of aerodynamic heating, the thermal thicket. And after 10 years in the making, it is ready for its first powered flight in late 1955. Prior to flight, the X-2 will be thoroughly ground tested. This is to be a dress rehearsal for actual flight. During the tie-down test, the X-2 will be firmly anchored to concrete to prevent a runaway.
As in preparations for a flight, the fuel truck pumps thousands of gallons of alcohol into the fuel tanks. Separate tanks are filled with liquid oxygen, the air supply for the engine. Liquid oxygen is cold, almost 300 degrees below zero. With the engine in operation, the oxygen will be combined with the alcohol for combustion. Attention, there'll be a rocket firing in 30 seconds. X2 is ready to fly, but how fast, how high, how much heat will it stand? No one knows. Before turning the plane over to the NACA for the main experimental phase, the Air Force prepares a series of tests to establish the X2's performance limits. Lieutenant Colonel Pete Everest veteran Air Force test pilot, will take the X-2 on its maiden powered flight. This is the payoff. Theory and laboratory tests are behind. Now a man sits in the cockpit of an untried airplane and makes it do what it was built to do. Vision from the cockpit is poor. Landings are blind. Everest takes directions from the pilot of a chase plane who tells him when to touch down. 20 feet, 10 feet, 5 feet, 5 feet, looks good, looks good, mighty fine. In eight flights, Everest carefully nurses the X-2 step by step to faster and faster speeds, higher altitudes, until in mid-summer of 1956, he establishes a new record of 1,900 miles per hour. On August 3, 1956, a new pilot relieves Everest in the X-2 flight test program. He is Captain Ivan Kinchlow, a Korean war ace and engineer, equipped by education and special training to fly into the unknown regions of space. On September 7, 1956, he establishes a new altitude record of 126,000 feet, almost 24 miles above the Earth, the highest man has ever been. Through the summer of 1956, while Kinchlow trained to undertake his phase of the test program, another pilot, Captain Milburn Apt, was also being briefed. Handpicked to alternate with Kinchlow because of his engineering background and his remarkable record in testing combat planes, Mel Apt is to fly the X-2 on its 13th flight. He will fly it only once. The date is 27 September 1956. This is a routine flight performance test. 
The X-2 will not take off under its own power, but will be carried to an altitude of 30,000 feet by a B-50 mothership in order to conserve its limited rocket fuel for actual flight testing. The B-50 is raised on hydraulic jacks, the X-2 is wheeled under it, and the mother plane is lowered again to engage the research plane beneath its bomb bay. secure. The two planes are mated and the X-2 will remain beneath the bomb bay until Captain Apt signals the B-50 pilot to release it. The time is 8.15. Apt is helped into a pressure suit and specially designed helmet. The B-50 crew makes ready. Until the B-50 is airborne, Apt will ride alone in the bubble nose. If he thinks at all about danger, perhaps this is the time. In a few moments, he will be too busy to think of anything but flying the X-2. Southwest 7, third for takeoff, over. The time, 8.35. Inside the B-50, technicians are performing the dangerous job of topping the X-2's fuel tanks with highly combustible liquid oxygen and alcohol. Altitude, 7,000 feet. Apt is in the cockpit of the X-2. A heavy canopy, able to withstand heat of 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit, is lowered and locked. A chase plane, piloted by Ivan Kinchlow, takes position. Okay, oxygen pressure normal. Pilots and technicians are methodically running through a checklist of over 200 items. Fuel system, electrical system, hydraulics. Apt is checking off the X-2's control surfaces while Kinchlow in the chase plane observes and confirms their operation. Time, 9.30. Altitude, 30,000 feet. The pilot of the B-50 removes the safety pin from the drop handle. Launch switch to drop position. Okay, we can drop you anytime. Give me the word for the countdown. Okay, counting from five to one. Five. One chance in a thousand that the X-2 will fly a perfect flight pattern. But the drop from the mother plane is perfect. So is Apt's reaction time. The rocket fuel will burn six seconds longer than expected. For the first time during the X-2 test program, everything goes according to plan. Within seconds, Apt is beyond the speed of sound and climbing to 70,000 feet. The air temperature outside the plane is minus 65 degrees, but the temperature rise due to aerodynamic heating, relayed by instruments in the plane to automatic computers on the ground, is recorded as more than 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Apt is well into the thermal thickness. There 
There's no sensation of speed at this altitude. Only his Mach meter tells Apt that he is approaching twice the speed of sound, over 1,300 miles per hour and still increasing speed. Mach 2.5, 2.7, Mach 3, three times the speed of sound. The temperature of the X2 is now recorded as over 600 degrees Fahrenheit. Automatic devices continue to trace the course of the X2. Its speed is now Mach 3.1, 3.2, 3.3, 2,178 miles per hour. And aft in the X2 is no longer in sight. His radio is silent. He has far outdistanced the chase planes. Radar has lost him. And now he is making history alone, out of sight, in the last few moments of his life. Two minutes and 20 seconds after the beginning of the flight, the X-2's rocket engine stopped. The fuel is gone. Six seconds later, Apt turns for his glide back to the base. His turn is too soon, at too high a speed, and the X-2 goes out of control. It pitches violently and begins to fall. The X-2 was not the first experimental plane to be lost. Mel Apt was the 13th test pilot to die at Edwards Air Force Base since 1950. But the deaths of these men are not without meaning, for each pilot is a bridge between the past and the future. Today, new planes are being ready. They will fly higher, faster than the X-2, and other men like Mel Apt will push back the frontiers of space a little more. And someday, the X-50 or the X-100 or the X-1000 will meet the promise of today, and we will build a plane that will take us on, even to the stars.